say about, because I think next year, next week, I think signals its 12th anniversary. And here's what we do. We do this every year. We're going to um, hang around after the service next week. We're going to go down to the cafeteria from 12 to 1230, have a meal together. And so you're just able to take everybody and just go down that way. And then we'll briefly, so we'll eat from 12 to 1230, from 1230 till 130 at the latest, we'll give you a little idea of how Hope came into being, how things happened here. There have been some pictures taken so that you can see behind the scenes as to what it takes to turn this thing into a place where we meet and the different people that function in different ways. So we will honor them by showing some images and then I'll wrap it up with a little bit. So it's an opportunity to, to be able to come and see how things happen, um, an opportunity to, to listen to how things began, an opportunity to hear about what's going to happen in the future. Good opportunity. We try to put it concise, put a lot in a little place. So that will be next week afterwards. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to hang around for that. It's really a good deal. We're, this week we're continuing our series, Jesus Under Investigation, The Da Vinci Code. Do you know that movie was coming? The Da Vinci Code? Is that, is that, have you seen anything about that? Talking to Don Sershka on the way he's, Goes over here, a lawyer, and he was going to Boston. He says it's all over the place, and it is. Any place you go, books, and more books, and more books. We are tackling it from a couple different perspectives. Uh, there's so many things that you could take issue with, um, but what we're focusing on are the two primary things that really cut to the heart of the matter. And the book casts doubt on the divinity of Jesus and the reliability of the scriptures, and that's kind of what we're going after. Uh, last week, when we looked at serious allegations, serious allegations, alleging that Jesus didn't claim to be divine, which the book does allege, that's a serious allegation. It's, it's contrary to what Jesus himself stated. Jesus claimed to be divine in no uncertain words. In fact, that's why he was killed. It doesn't make any sense that people picked up rocks to stone him other than the fact that they understood that he was claiming to be God because that's why you stoned somebody in those days. So he said something, they picked up rocks. Why? They didn't pick up rocks because he was a good moral teacher. He claimed to be God. That's why they picked up stones. That's why they wanted to kill him and did kill him. He claimed to be divine and his followers described him as divine. Um, serious allegation to say that he wasn't. We're going to look at the questionable credibility this week and next week of those writings that seem to give rise to some of these things that are described in the book and that are so popular today, and that's what we'll look at today. We'll start by talking about the lost writers of the lost Gospels. One of the books out now are the lost Gospels. That seems to be the thing that's in focus. You might say, what's that about? Turn to the back of the worship folder. I wanted to print some things out. It's looks like a lot of writing. I wanted you to have something to have with you so that you could refer to this. I'm going to read through some of this stuff and um, read along. In December 1945, an Arab peasant made an astonishing archaeological discovery in Upper Egypt. Digging around a massive boulder, they hit a red earthenware jar. The jar was about a meter high. They smashed the jar. And then in the process of determining the contents, there was some things that happened. Anyways, what happened as we go on, discovered inside 13 papyrus books bound in leather and some loose papyrus leaves as well. It contained the gospel according to Thomas. A, a, a image, a, a bit of that in one of the bound leather volumes, which is the, re, the source from which Dan Brown gets some of his stuff. Um, yet, unlike the Gospels of the New Testament, this text identified itself as a secret gospel. Bound into the same volume with it is the Gospel of Philip, which attributes to Jesus acts and sayings quite different from those in the New Testament, from the Gospel of Philip. The companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene, but Christ loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on the mouth, on her mouth. The rest of the disciples were offended. They said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? 
The Savior answered and said to them, Why do I not love you as I love her? Other sayings in this collection criticize common Christian beliefs, such as the virgin birth, the bodily resurrection, and it describes them as naive misunderstandings. And here's what they ended up doing. Nag Hammadi texts, these texts that they found there, and others like them were circulated at the beginning of the Christian era. These things were traveling around in those days as they are traveling around these days as well. They were denounced as heresy by Orthodox Christians in the middle of the second century. They come from the Gnostic Gospels by Elaine Pagels. And they were quick because it was clear what they were doing and what they were. Why were they rejected? Is it some kind of conspiracy? Was it a church thing? It really wasn't. They were they were seen as heretical because, well, number one, they rejected the Bible Jesus read. They rejected the Bible Jesus read. In the book, The Da Vinci Code, the, the authority, Sir Tebing, claims that there has never been a definitive version of the Bible. It was collated by Constantine in the 4th century at the time that Jesus, it was being voted on whether Jesus was divine or not, gives you the impression that there really hasn't been one Bible, that it kind of has been altered by whoever was in power in order to suit their own needs. You know, the problem with that is Jesus read the Bible. Jesus existed 300 years before Constantine. He said, wait, aren't there two, yeah, aren't there two halves? Yeah, there are two halves to the Bible. The Old Testament is the Bible that Jesus read, existed at that time. He immersed himself in the Old Testament of the Bible. He understood it. He quoted from it all the time in his ministry. Next week, we will look at how the Gnostic Gospels compare with the New Testament documents. This week, we're going to look at how the writers looked at the Old Testament documents. And as we look at this, it will become clear why the lost writers of the lost gospel were indeed lost in terms of what they believed about the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus read, specifically what they believed about the creation. You're not going to believe it. The Hebrew scriptures as we know them today were collected and recognized long before Constantine. He existed in the 4th century, and the Hebrew scriptures had been decided upon, Malachi was the last book, 400 B.C. They were converted from Hebrew to Greek because many of the Jews were, had moved out of Israel into the Roman Empire and they needed to have a Bible in the language that they spoke and read from, which was Greek. So between 250 B.C. and 150 B.C., a version of the Old Testament of the Bible, written in Greek, called the Septuagint, was published. And again, five, six hundred years before Constantine, and this would have been the Bible that Jesus would have known about. He probably would have read it in Hebrew. But the Old Testament of the Bible had been formed by that, by that time. The books of the Old Testament were collected and translated into Greek, not by the Vatican, nor by Emperor Constantine, not even by early Christians, but more than 100 years before Jesus' birth, as a result of the consensus of generations of Jewish scholars. So we're saying the Old Testament existed long before Jesus came into being. There were some writings that occurred from the time that Malachi wrote, who is the last book in the Old Testament, very last one, it would go from Malachi to Matthew. There were some writings between the writing of Malachi and when Jesus came. They're called, and some of them were included by some churches into the Bible. They were called the apocryphal books, the apocrypha. Uh, in Catholic Bibles, many Catholic Bibles, you'll find that they contain some extra books that other Bibles don't have. And... We go, the apocryphal books, they are interesting. The thing is that they would not have been a part of the Bible that Jesus read. Je the Bible Jesus read would not have had the apocryphal books. It would have had the 39 books of the Old Testament that the Jews felt were scriptural. Jesus um, and the apostles quoted 
from these Hebrew scriptures. They never quoted from any of the apocryphal books. That's why you won't find the Bible I have. doesn't have those extra books in it. Uh, we, by and large, go by the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures, the ones they ratified, the ones the Bible Jesus would have read. Why? We make the thing, the allegation that the lost writers of the lost gospel rejected the Bible Jesus read. Look what it says, in, again on the back side. Scholars investigating the Nag Hammadi find discovered that some of the texts tell the origin of the human race in terms very different from the usual reading of Genesis. The Testimony of Truth, one of the Gnostic writings, for example, tells the story of the Garden of Eden from the viewpoint of the serpent. Here, the serpent, long known to appear in Gnostic literature as the principle of divine wisdom, convinces Adam and Eve to partake of knowledge while the Lord threatens them with death, trying jealously to prevent them from attaining knowledge and expelling them from paradise when they achieve it. The Nag Hammadi texts and others like them, which circulated at the beginning of the Christian era, were denounced as heresy by Orthodox Christians in the middle of the second century. Gnosticism was an attack upon the nature of God. It opposed traditional Jewish scriptures. It opposed the Bible that Jesus would have read. And it especially the first few chapters of Genesis. According to Gnostic thought, all matter is evil. Everything that you can touch that's physical is evil. The creator, the God of the Bible, the God who appears in the first chapters of Genesis, was evil because he made the material world. You say, say what might say, what? Um, let me tell you that again. Here's what they believed. Since matter is evil, the God who brought the physical world into being was evil as well. They believe that? Yes, they believe that. Why do we hear that? I don't know. Gosh. Now listen to this. The serpent was helpful because he helped Adam and Eve shake off the deception perpetrated on them by the Creator. So the serpent ends up being not evil, but good. He really helped Adam and Eve out because he helped them get knowledge. The word Gnostic, it comes from the Greek word for knowledge. And since he is the one through whom they come to have the knowledge of good and evil, he ends up in Gnostic belief, ends up being the good guy. Eve was the person who, because of her influence, became the vessel through which knowledge came into the world, and she ends up being the Savior. Gnosticism has been called the religion of rebellion. It is an upside downing of the Bible. Take the Bible, turn it on its head, and that's what Gnosticism is. The Creator is bad, Satan is good, Eve is the Savior. Turn everything upside down. Gnosticism, again, gained its name from gnosis, the Greek word which is used here to indicate knowledge. Gnostics claimed that they had special secret knowledge. There was a bunch of different kinds of Gnosticism. No two writers said ex exactly the same thing. They talked in allegory. Some of the stuff is really hard to get through. Um, most varieties, though, present an explanation of the beginning of the world which features a, a supreme being far higher than the God of the Hebrew Bible. In case you didn't hear me the first time, I'll take another run at this so you'll understand kind of how their thinking evolved. Here's, here we go again. Sometimes the supreme being is female rather than male. That was common in those days. They called the God of Genesis 1 through 3 Ialda Beoth. Ialda Beoth. And he was one of the lower powers. The way they thought things happened in those days is that sometimes a male god and a female god would procreate and make lower gods. And so Ialdabaoth was one of these lower gods. And that's how he came into the scene. You know, boy, thank goodness we live in a much more enlightened age today. And, and we know... <laughs> things didn't come into being by that. We know that there was a giant explosion that occurred. 
And we come from multiplying single cell organisms. <laughs> We're far more enlightened today. <laughs> Not how the world came into being. Crazy. Anyways, this lower power creates the physical world, and according to Gnostic view, that's a really bad mistake. The God of the Bible comes off really badly, not only because he creates the physical world, but because he thinks he is the supreme deity when he is not. Ial de Beoth is so blind that he does not even know of the existence of higher powers. He thinks he's God, and he's so deceived that he thinks he's God when he's not. That's what they believed. And in the Apocryphon of John, one of the Gnostic writings, Eyal de Beoth, in his arrogance, I'm quoting, boasted that all these things were under him and said, I am the Father and God, and there is no one above me. However, his mother heard him, a higher God than him, and shouted out against him, Do not lie, Eyal de Beoth. And so that's one of their writings, that the mother who was above him shouted at him because he thought he was the supreme being and he wasn't. When Adam and Eve are in the garden, they believe that Ialdabaoth is the supreme being, so they're deceived. They think he's supreme because he tells them he's supreme, but he's not. And what ends up happening, Satan, assuming the form of a serpent, communicates this wonderful gnosis to Eve, this wonderful knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge of the way things really are. He is not the supreme deity. There are supreme deities above him. In fact, if you will forget the material part of the world and just give yourself to spiritual enlightenment, you will ascend to the level where you can have this higher secret spiritual understanding. That was what he communicated to Adam and Eve. The two of them now seeking the supreme being who is far above the material world, not the God of the Bible now, a being above him, and rise from the earth to his abode in pure spirituality and seek to escape the unfortunate influence of Ialdabaoth because Ialdabaoth was angry about this. He hurled Satan down to the earth. And that's how they say things came into being. I don't know why we're not hearing that. Why don't we hear that? This is not a reach. This is what Gnosticism taught. We're not going to hear a lot about that because culturally, and this kind of grieves me, we don't believe it culturally that he was creator either. I know we might have some, you know, some of us might have some issues. I, 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 I can't believe that the word evolved. I just can't believe the world evolved. It has to have been created, but the best and brightest in our world at this time believe the world evolved. And you know what? I think why we're not going to hear much about this part of why their writing should not be seen as true is because culturally, I don't think the press would say that. Call into question something because they question the creation, because it's questioned all the time. What does the Bible say? The Bible Jesus read, here's what it would have said. It's on the other side of the sheet. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. Later on in the same chapter, Isaiah writes, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Gnostics would have said, No, that's not true. And it is true. This world did not evolve. It wasn't Ialdabaoth being deceived and Satan wasn't a good guy. It's just not true. And because they believe that, it calls into question everything else they say.
They rejected the Bible Jesus read. And they rejected the Father Jesus loved. Jesus said, trust in God, trust also in me. To believe in Jesus, you have to believe in God. I think that's what it says. Jesus said to them, you believe in God, believe also in me. What does it mean to believe in God? What we're going to see? To believe in God means you believe in one who is creator, who rules over the world. That's what it means to believe in God. Culturally, we have a number of people who believe in Jesus, but don't believe in God. They will believe in a Savior who is postured as beaten up, and they'll go to the Passion and feel sorry for this pitiful figure, but they don't believe that he existed eternally, brilliantly, and powerfully. And they don't believe that he brought the world into creation and that he rules over the world. But that's the truth. And that's what they rejected. What it says, the last, the Bible Jesus read by Philip Yancey, I wanted you to have this too. Let me read it. Although Jesus is the image of the invisible God, he emptied himself of many of the prerogatives of God in order to become a man. The late professor Langdon Gilkey used to say that if evangelical Christianity has a heresy, it is the neglect of God the Father, the creator, preserver, and ruler of all human history and every human community in favor of Jesus the Son who relates to individual souls and their destinies. He goes on, if we, only, if we had only the Gospels, we would envision a God who seems confined, all too human, and rather weak. After all, Jesus ended up hanging on a cross. The Jews objected so strongly to Jesus because, despite his audacious claims, he did not match their conception of what God is like. They rejected him for not measuring up. The book of Revelation gives a different glimpse of Jesus. Blazing light, stunning in glory, unlimited in power, and the Old Testament, likewise, fills in a different portrayal of God. Like Jesus' original disciples, we need that background picture in order to appreciate how much love the incarnation, him coming to earth, expressed, how much God gave up on our behalf. I think that's very well stated. To put belief in a Jesus who is meek and mild, and Jesus was loving and caring, but we need the background in order to understand what he was before and what he is now, brilliant, powerful, as we said when we were going through Revelation, large and in charge, and God is. He is creator, he's ruler over the world. And this is what they called into question. They rejected the Bible Jesus read and rejected the Father Jesus loved. C.S. Lewis, when he was writing the Chronicles of Narnia, tried to come up with some kind of image of Jesus and ended up casting him not as a lamb, but as a lion. We're going to see a little clip from the Chronicles of Narnia, which starts with uh, when Aslan, you'll see him as the lion, had been killed, comes back to life, and uh, we're going to roll that clip. And again, it's C.S. Lewis, his attempt to find a way to depict Jesus in a way that is not very safe. There's a side of Jesus that's safe, but Jesus is God. The one who brought this world into being. The ruler of the world. Let's, let's see the clip.
done. the deep magic differently. That when a willing victim who has committed no treachery is killed in a traitor's stead, the stone table will crack, and even death itself would turn backwards. We sent the news that you were dead. Peter and Evan will have gone to war. We have to help them. We will, dear one, but not alone. Climb on my back. We have far to go, and little time to get there. You may want to cover your ears. Jesus, God with an English accent. I could. <laughs> I just can't do that. I can't. <laughs> that was his attempt. When you read the book, it's, it's even clearer that when they come alongside Aslan, there's a place, there's a part of him that's loving, but a part of him that's very unsafe. Trying to capture both sides. A Jesus who is on our level, but a Jesus who does not really exist on our level. Who, again, says and, and is that which these writers claim that he was not. Ruler over the world and the creator of the world. I think that's what it means to believe in God, God's essential responsibilities. He is the world's ruler. Look what it says. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. He determined the times set for them the exact places where they should live. He has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Look back down, pick out a couple things here. God made the world and everything in it. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He is the ruler of heaven and earth. Determines what they do, how long they exist says he doesn't live in temples built by hands. He doesn't live in church. He doesn't live in any building we build for him. He could not. He created them. Goes on to say, as if he needed anything. He's not served by human hands. Sometimes people make appeals. Please do this for God. God's not on his last dime. And if we don't serve him, he's going to be fine. He brought everything into being. We get this picture of God that He's this little controllable thing. That if I have a bad day, God's up in heaven going, oh my, oh goodness. That's not Him at all. We have this picture of Him that we control Him. We don't control Him. He is so far, He's loving, but He is so far above. It says He gives us life and breath and everything else from one man. He made every nation of men. And He determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God is not surprised that we are here in this nation at this time and that America is powerful now as He knew Rome would be powerful then and Greece before it. When is our time? I don't know. God knows. And it says that there will come a time of judgment when God will stand as judge over the world and judge what they believed is true about Him and how they acted in correspondence with that truth. And I don't think He's going to be very pleased with individuals that said that He was some lower deity. And he will not be as accepting. Because people are being deceived by that. And he will not be pleased.
It says he has given proof of this by raising Jesus from the dead. And Jesus being rising from the dead means that he is the Savior, but it also means that he's the judge and that there will be a judgment. He is the world's ruler and he's the world's creator. It says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish heart was darkened. It says, interesting here, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the godlessness of men who suppress the truth in wickedness. For what is known about God through the creation, God made plain through the creation, there's things that we can know about God just by looking outside or looking at your hands or looking into the eyes of somebody next to you. We did not evolve. There's things that we can know about God. And it says these things are suppressed. And because they were, it says, God made understanding become darkened. And it means that those who don't see God as creator cannot see anything clearly. Here's, see, and, and I'm not blowing, if, if you're saying, Mike, boy, you know, I have trouble with creation, you know, and, and there's some things about it that I don't understand. Yeah, it's really a stretch. I agree that there was a God who eternally existed and brought everything into being. It's a bigger stretch for me to believe that it just blew up into existence. And so I'm not saying if you have a doubt, but I'm saying let's, let's talk about the implications. There's a lot of hand-wringing about the state of morality in the world today. And rightly so. What this verse indicates is that the the moral deterioration we're experiencing, that's not so much the reason for judgment as the result of it. Listen to what I'm saying. Because they did not acknowledge him as God, it says, God gave them over to darkened understanding, so nothing is clear. It indicates that the moral degeneration is not the reason for judgment, but the result of it. It's as if God said, if you're not going to acknowledge me as creator, and again, not we acknowledge him as creator, but as culturally, the best and brightest in our country don't. Uh, That's questionable, the best and brightest. Many in our country don't believe that God created the world. Many. And what it says, as culturally, God says, okay, go. Serve the things that seem good for you to serve. And the people who wring hands about the moral deterioration, I don't think there's understanding that it's directly related to the belief. Disbelieving in God as creator means that we get cut loose from being able to determine things in a way, making decisions that make sense morally. Not believing leads to not behaving. And I think that's, that's the point in this passage. I think it, there's a progression. Tune out God, tune in self, turn from God. I think that's the way it works. Tune out God, tune in self, Turn from God. And culturally, we're probably somewhere between tune in self and, and turn from God. Ask the worship team to come up. What should we do? What should we do? A couple things on an individual basis. Um, let me encourage you. I don't want to frighten you. I want to say this clearly before we sing the last song. It's okay to doubt. It really is. 
Adopt this posture as a doubter. Put yourself at God's feet. Say, God, I don't understand everything. Would you make it clear to me? See, that's a humble posture. Somebody who says, you can't be, I have trouble with that. Lots of things we doubt. Put yourself at God's feet. Say, God, I want to know you. Would you help me to know what you're like? If you're as great and big, I want to sit at your feet and I want to get to know you. I think that would be a good decision. Some of us, I was talking to somebody a little bit earlier, uh, related to responding to the Da Vinci Code stuff. There's so much stuff out there, it's hard to know what to focus on. In the worship folder, there's that yellow sheet. That's what we're going to do Saturday morning. We met yesterday morning, had a good group of people. What we'll do for a couple of hours, we'll try to make it simple. We'll talk about all the different things, and I'll put some information in your hands, a book, a magazine, some reproducible sheets that will enable you to respond and to help people see Jesus did claim to be God and the Bible is reliable. Those are the major things called into question by this movie. And so, if you fill out the sheet, put it in the Hope mailbox, we'll get that. Some of you, this Saturday is not going to work. If enough of you indicate that you would like to be a part of a two-hour training thing like this, and Saturday is not going to work, we're going to create other times. I think this is important. Let's close by singing a song. Things. Would you give us clarity relative to what is true and what is not? I don't want to go off half-cocked and blow people up. That's not, no. I, but it seems that it's important for us to be able to have some kind of sense of what is true. There's so much interpretation out there. And, and I guess for us, God, would you help make that clear to us? Help us to see you for who you really are? To entertain beliefs that are true and accurate so we'll have some kind of ground to stand on, some kind of clarity. Would you help us to identify you for who you are as creator and ruler? There are a bunch of questions, but would you give us the humility to sit before you and ask them, to go to your word, to go to one another, to try to figure out things that don't make sense, but to be disciples, learners. And then as we interact with others, would you give us grace to be gentle, kind, but straightforward, uh, and, and when we have opportunities, to be able to bring questions and maybe bring clarity to a person who's trying to find their way. I'd ask you to help us to do this and help us as well as, as we seek to become more authentic followers of yours. I'm real glad that, that you do speak yourself out and you really want to be known. And I guess that's where I want to land. Would you help us to know you? Uh, in your own heart, is that something you want? Why don't you tell that to God? He really does want to be known. You ask him. Reveal yourself to us, Father. Amen. Great. If you have the um, those sheets.